evening. Um, one thing I want to just mention before I begin is that on the last two webinars, uh, the last 15 minutes of each webinar, I did not get to, and I had to push it to the next one. So two times ago, I pushed it forward 15 minutes, and last time, I didn't get to the last 15 minutes again. And I would like to get on target so that in uh, uh, subsequent webinars, I'll be starting from where I want to start. And that would mean uh, that uh, this particular webinar will probably go an extra 15 minutes so that I could catch up. Uh, because last time I didn't quite do it all from the time before, I didn't quite do it all either. Uh, so we should probably have an extra 15 minutes today. Of course, if you don't want to stay for the whole thing, that's fine too. But um, uh, I should tell you ahead of time, we'll be going a little bit longer today. Uh, and in particular, there's a section from last time I was going to start from to uh, finish up what I didn't talk about. And uh, last webinar, webinar number seven, um, was uh, about evolution and a variety of novels that were written um, after the 20, 30 years from the publication of Origin of Species and uh, The Descent of Man. And a lot of them I got to, but there's a few that I didn't get to, and in particular surrounding aliens and the Martians. And that's what I was going to talk about first. And that's a good segue into H.G. Wells anyway, since some of this has to do with things that uh, were provoked by H.G. Wells, in fact. So uh, as a starting point, back in the 1880s, 1890s, Mars became a subject of great fascination in Europe and in the United States. And if you recall, Camille Flammarion, the great astronomer from France, had written about Mars and Martians and the evolution of Martian life. And in 1877, uh, Giovanni Scaparelli, an Italian astronomer, uh, uh, published uh, a paper in which he said that he observed canali, the Italian word, on Mars. And canali could be translated as either channels or canals. And Percival Lowell, who was one of the great American astronomers, translated it as canals. Now, the story of Percival Lowell is very interesting because he was a highly recognized scientific based astronomer in the United States, and in fact, was responsible for the uh, Lowell Observatory here in Flagstaff, Arizona. And Lowell became convinced that there were canals on Mars, that he could see them through his telescope, that in fact, on this uh, slide, you can see a couple of his drawings of those canals. He also said he could observe oases uh, on Mars, and he was convinced that there was an ancient civilization living on Mars. And in fact, here's a newspaper article um, uh, about uh, Lowell's ideas, and that uh, the title line is, There is Life on the Planet Mars. Professor Percival Lowell, recognized as the greatest authority on the subject, declares that there can be no doubt that living beings inhabit our neighbor's world. Now, it's fascinating, not just simply that he was convinced, but that he was convinced he could see, observe those canals through his telescope. He had a theoretical explanation in his mind regarding why there should be life on Mars. Mars was presumably older than the Earth, but his observations were consistent with this theory he had. Now, keep in mind that when other people went looking later in more detail for those canals, they could not be found. But at the time, Lowell thought he could see them. Now, this is a beautiful example of the theoretical nature of facts, that somebody who believes in a particular theory will literally see facts, in this case here, observations of canals on Mars that indeed, on closer inspection, 
do not really exist. So when a person is convinced of something, they will often have observations that are very consistent with their theory, even though it turns out that there were no things to observe there. There were no canals on Mars. There aren't any canals on Mars. And Lowell is recognized as a scientific authority, in fact, a reputable scientist who thinks this is a plausible, scientifically credible idea. So Lowell wrote a whole series of books on Mars, stimulated people's imagination about Mars, and in the next, uh, in, in this period of 1880 to 1900, there were lots of stories written about the Martians, and in fact, other aliens in our solar system. And a place that uh, histories in science fiction usually begin is with um, uh, Percy Gregg's Across the Zodiac, which I will get to in a moment. But just to give you an illustration of how much imagination and variety uh, the human mind could uh, uh, create in terms of what the Martians look like, here is a composite of a artistic uh, rendition of different ideas of what the Martians look like. And notice it's a real assortment of types of creatures that were invented by the human mind. Down in the right-hand bottom corner are H.G. Wells' Martians from the War of the World, uh, War of the Worlds. In the middle and up on the right-hand side are illustrations of the Martians from Stanley Wambaum's uh, Martian Odyssey. Over to the left are images of the Martians from across the Zodiac. But human imagination went really crazy, literally, and very inventive in thinking of what these Martians might look like up there on the planet Mars. All kinds of different uh, uh, visualizations uh, of uh, our Martian neighbors of all different shapes and sizes. Um, even Olaf Stapleton's uh, drop uh, five Martian mines up in the left-hand side, uh, a totally different kind of idea of Mars. But let's just look first at Across the Zodiac, which came out around 1880 by um, uh, 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 Percy uh, Gregg. And Percy Gregg was a political writer, political philosopher, who published this book called Across the Zodiac, The Story of a Wrecked Record. And what Gregg presented in the uh, novel was that he presumably had been given this um, uh, chronicle by somebody else of their trip to Mars. And he deciphered, translated, and edited it, and then he published it. And a fascinating thing about this book, two things connected, is that Greg created this intricate, elaborate description of Martians and Martian society that he called Marshals, actually. He didn't call them Martians. And it was a very, very detailed um, overview of um, what Martian civilization is like and what the people are like, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Greg, being a political writer, he had a philosophical political point to try to present in this novel. It's a novel, it's fiction, it's narrative, but he makes a philosophical point. And the philosophical point he tries to make is that the Martians are very advanced scientifically, technologically, but they have outlawed religion and therefore they're totally immoral and they only live for pleasure. And because they've let science dominate their culture, they have no character and they have no ethics. And in his mind, and this is an argument that he's presented here, is that if we did away with religion and let science rule the world, we would turn into immoral, pleasure-seeking characters without any sense of right and wrong. And even though we might be physically and technologically advanced, we sure as hell are gonna lose our sense of morality in the process. Now, the thing to notice about this particular novel also is that a writer is creating an alien world, an alien civilization, but he's using it as a way to depict either an ideal society or a dystopian society. There's aliens and alien civilizations 
have been used by science fiction writers as um, canvases on which to imagine what would be a desirable reality, an admired reality versus a terrible and ugly reality. So aliens have been used as substitutes for dystopian and utopian novels uh, about humans down on Earth as a, a thought experiment. What would happen if science ruled the world? This is what would happen. It would be terrible. And that was Gray in around 1880. Now, around the same time, uh, anonymous writer from New Zealand, in fact, it's important to note here, New Zealand was producing some significant science fiction writers uh, from the last time I mentioned Samuel, Samuel Butler and Erewhon. Uh, the Great Romance was published in two parts in a New Zealand um, magazine. The, the author has never been identified except for the term that that author used, the inhabitant. And it's a totally different kind of book than Across the Zodiac. The Great Romance is very poetic, mysterious, uh, filled with psychological, mystical ambience. It's a story about future humanity and future humanity developing telepathic powers which allow for the advance of human civilization. And the first part of the book is a mesmerizing description of advanced human civilization in the future. The second part of the book is about humanity deciding to go to Venus and see what was up on Venus. And Venus turns out to be a tropical planet and with lots of animals and plants. And one of the visitors from the Earth encounters intelligent Venusians, but they're not exactly humanoid. And they seem to be rather erotic, erotically charged beings. And the, um, uh, the traveler from the Earth actually sits and contemplates in, in, in philosophical depth the mystery of time, the mystery of the universe, the mystery of life, and also what it would be like to have sex with aliens. Um, and it's a totally different kind of book, very, very interesting. It's in print again, uh, but it's us visiting Venus and encountering different kinds of aliens that are not human, uh, humanoid at all. And in this book is another theme that's going to run through science fiction. The argument is first presented that we're going to evolve, advance socially, technologically on Earth, and that's going to be the impetus and the drive for us to go out then and explore the universe, which is what humans in this novel decide to do, that as they develop their powers on the Earth, as our civilization grows and grows and grows, that the next step is, of course, to explore outer space. Now, the next one that we come to, which was written a little bit later, A Journey in Other Worlds, is the first American science fiction bestseller. And it was, it was written in 1894, 1895, by, of all people, John Jacob Astor. And John Jacob Astor was one of the richest people in the world. He was the person responsible for creating the Astor Hotel uh, in uh, Astoria Hotel in um, New York. And, and, and he was a very successful, obviously, businessman, but he also was an extremely intelligent and educated person on uh, technology, industry, politics. He was a, a very uh, broad-based uh, intellect all across the board, but he was filthy rich too. And he wrote A Journey in Other Worlds, which took place in the future as well. And what Astor did in this book was that, first of all, he presented a very intelligent and thoughtful extrapolation on present humanity into the future along multiple dimensions from industry and politics and economics and science and technology that he gives you a very, very detailed vision of a future Earth. And he's very optimistic about secular progress, that through science, technology, reason, et cetera, 
we can significantly advance uh, human civilization. And when the novel opens, uh, uh, humanity is thoughtfully considering building a spaceship to go explore the solar system for purposes of seeing what planets out there can be colonized. And so the, uh, and Astor is American here, so the vision of humanity or the Western humanity exploring and settling the wilderness clearly comes through in his novel. And the first part is very impressive in terms of his uh, uh, scientific technological extrapolations and his political economic ones. And it describes a ship that goes and explores the solar system, in particular, Jupiter and Saturn. And on Jupiter, they find this gigantic world, jungle-like, filled with all kinds of ferocious creatures. And they literally go on a safari, uh, uh, exploring the land and shooting various alien animals. But then when they go to Saturn and they decide Jupiter is worth colonizing and uh, uh, Astor goes into a big ecological and evolutionary exposition on how life evolves. When they go to Saturn, not only do they find other strange creatures, but they find human goats who had lived on the earth and have ascended to a higher level of existence as spirits on Saturn. And as you recall, this was Flammarion's idea back 10, 20 years earlier. And so the explorers have a conversation with the ghosts up there on Saturn. And then Astor goes into a cosmological exposition that is informed by Christianity, but also informed by modern astronomy, in which he sees and describes how the whole universe is evolving progressively and ascending toward God and the good. And indeed, there is an embodiment of the devil and Satan, and the devil in hell, in the cosmos. And he gets into this very elaborate exposition of this long-term cosmic process that's going on in our universe. And he attempts, in essence, to try to come up with a unified picture that pulls together Christianity with 20th century, late 19th century cosmology. And it's a very well done uh, novel. One of the best novels, uh, science fiction novels of the 19th century for sure. And it sort of lays some of the seeds for Olaf Stapleton later on, who got into big cosmic speculations about the evolution of intelligence in the universe. But I would definitely recommend this uh, in terms of understanding how a very intelligent, educated, and, but also very successful man was able to conceptualize our future evolution with spirituality, Christianity, science, and politics, and economics all integrated into one big picture. And along the way, you have an interesting safari journey on Jupiter shooting animals. <laughs> which is 19th century American mentality. Go out and shoot the bison. Um, now, the last two uh, novels of the late 19th century I'm going to come to, um, both have to do with Mars, both have to do with Martians, and they're both very interesting in uh, different respects. Um, Kurt Laswitz is identified as the father of German science fiction. He was a philosopher and a historian of science who in 1897, this is the year before The War of the Worlds was published, wrote a book called Two Planets. And it was about an invasion of the Martians on the earth, but a totally different kind of vision than The War of the Worlds because the Martians, although they are vastly more advanced than us, scientifically, technologically, are also much more advanced than us mentally and ethically. From birth, Martians are taught as the fundamental skill how to control and evolve their minds. Martians, the, these Martians, Laswitz points out, emphasize self-responsibility and personal development of one's consciousness. 
and their technology and science is a consequence of having very advanced minds. And they decide that they are gonna come to Earth and they're gonna show themselves and they're gonna try to educate humanity to evolve its own mind, our own minds, and come up to where the um, uh, Martians are. But humanity doesn't want to be controlled. A war breaks out. There's all kinds of craziness that goes on. And in the end, it's a study. And even if you're more advanced than someone else is, or you think you are, you can't just go in and take your ideas and try to impose them upon a more primitive being or race. And this is, of course, a veiled criticism of uh, Western uh, colonialists trying to control and modify and change what they perceive as more primitive beings and um, in the interest of making them better. Now, Lanswitz produces in this novel also the most intricate and scientifically informed and detailed image yet so far of Martian civilization. This is un unequivocally the best, most well-developed vision of the Martians yet in 1897. It vastly exceeds what Wells did a year later and anybody else had done. And that's because Laswitz had a really good solid background in science and technology. But Laswitz is also arguing here that science and technology isn't enough. That actually the Martians achieve what they do achieve because they've evolved their minds. Now, the last one, and, and on that one, you could also get a good uh, discussion in the novel of what it would mean to evolve one's mind, both ethically and intellectually. Lazarus does a very good job of that. Now, the last one I have up here is Edison's Conquest of Mars uh, by Garrett Service. Now, this came out in 1898, and it came out within a year after the War of the Worlds. Now, I haven't talked about the War of the Worlds yet, but I wanted to talk about this one first because uh, Garrett Service was an astronomer, and when the War of the Worlds was published, it was actually republished in, in a variety of other forms in the United States, one of which was called Fighters from Mars, The War of the Worlds, near Boston. And Garrett's service felt like the War of the Worlds scenario was a very insulting, depressive scenario that an alien civilization could beat the hell out of the West and the might and military power of the West. He thought that the novel, even though it was fictional, was an insult to uh, Western um, uh, uh, elitism and supremacy. And so he actually went and talked to Thomas Edison and decided he was going to write a rebuttal to the War of the Worlds called Edison's Conquest of Mars. He took Edison and put him in as a fictional character in the novel and had Edison in the novel create an armada of spaceships that Edison designed, electrically powered spaceships, with the first example of ray guns ever. And humanity went out and attacked Mars and invaded it and killed millions of Martians, including the King of Mars, and got back human pride, uh, re, 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 uh, uh, you know, reachieved our human pride that you know, the Martians couldn't come down here and beat the hell out of us, we're gonna go up there and beat the hell out of Mars. And um, a variety of illustrations are actually done, one of which includes a picture of Garrett Service sitting with Thomas Edison, discussing with Thomas Edison the best way to invade Mars. Now notice that that image is of something that never really happened because the Martians never really invaded the Earth, it was only fiction. But he, puts the, he creates this image of him talking with Edison of actually how to go about defeating the Martians. This is a good example of where fact mixes with fiction, where something happens in fiction which has an impact on culture, psychology, and somebody writes a response to it that turns into another novel, another fictional piece of work that includes real people, 
And Edison, of course, came up before in um, The Future Eve as a character in a science fiction novel. And we're going to go beat the hell out of those Martians before they come down here and invade us again. Uh, although they never really invaded us. So that are, those are some of the stories, some of the novels of uh, the late 19th century that revolved around the Martians and exploring other planets and aliens and alien civilizations and issues of technology, religion, science, and what it would mean for the human mind to evolve. And it's done through looking at, you know, different hypothetical uh, types of aliens. Um, and now this, of course, then brings us to H.G. Wells, which is going to be the topic for today. And um, I need to move out of that one and open our next one. And so here we come to module eight, to H.G. Wells. Now, <clears throat> I have up here that H.G. Wells could be considered the father of modern science fiction, but he could also be considered the father of modern future studies. And as I go through uh, the uh, webinar on him, I'm going to show you a lot of ways in which you would end up thinking that about him, that he was indeed the significant starting point for both modern science fiction and modern future studies. H.G. Uh, Wells wrote over 120 books while he was alive, and more of them were nonfiction than fiction. He's remembered today more so for his science fiction, but he actually wrote 20 more books that were nonfiction. And his biggest selling book was a nonfiction book, which was an outline of history. Um, the thing about, and there's many things about Wells to consider when we you know, uh, 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 think him through. Um, he created numerous fundamental science fiction scenarios like time travel, alien invasion, invisibility, messing biotechnologically with humans, uh, and other ones besides. He was an architect of a lot of different basic science fiction scenarios that later on were taken up by other people in a lot of different forms. But he also attempted to predict and imagine the future in great detail, created many warnings about things that could go wrong in the future, he developed a whole slew of utopias, images of the direction we should go in, and he wrote tons of stuff on modern human character. And on top of it all, he was, for his time, and probably still, the most influential futurist who ever lived. Wells conferred with Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Stalin, Lenin, Pavlov, Wells knew the political, central political figures of his time, was friends with some of them, and had a big impact on thinking uh, while he, and he was very, very visible during his time. So Wells is a very complex, intelligent, well-educated, passionate thinker, who had a big, big impact on the evolution of future consciousness, for sure. In fact, as a starting point, it's important to be impressed by his scholarly depth, incredible. His erudition, his creativity, his productivity. Science fiction gets deathly serious with Wells. It becomes the literature of what are the fundamental issues of life and of humanity, and how do we evolve and transform humanity? That's what Wells was all about. And this webinar is based on chapters one and two of volume two of my uh, series, uh, in this case, um, chapters one and two from The Time Machine to Metropolis. And as an outline for this webinar and what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to talk about Wells' early education and his development uh, before he became a, a well-known writer. Then I'm going to talk about his early period of writing before the time machine when he wrote 
an immense number of articles and essays about evolution, time, ethics, and the future of humanity. This is where his ideas began to come together when he was in his 20s, and he became a very successful and popular writer of short essays uh, during that time. And then I'm gonna talk about his famous early fantastical science fiction, from the time machine to the first men in the moon. And then I'm gonna talk about Wells becoming a futurist in the period of 1901 to 1908, when he started literally a second career after being successful as a science fiction writer. Then we'll move into all of his utopian and dystopian science fiction, which was informed by his futurist thinking and his visions of future war. And then we'll finish up with looking at his later nonfiction um, up to uh, his big roadmaps that he created of how to make for a better world and end with his last published novel, Mind at the End of Its Tether and the Legacy of H.G. Wells and uh, how his, um, uh, probably his feelings and thoughts about the future of humanity uh, began to change circa, you know, right when World War II was ending. Now, a good, one good starting point for Wells is to compare him with Jules Verne. This is what Jules Verne actually said about H.G. Wells. I make use, use of physics, he invents. I go to the moon and a cannonball discharged from a cannon. Here, there is no invention. That's not true, but that's what he said. He goes to Mars in an airship. Well, he never really went to Mars. Vern got that botched up. He went to the moon, which he constructs of a material that does away with the laws of gravity. Show me this metal. Let him produce it. And so Vern accuses Wells in this quote of fabricating, inventing something which isn't scientifically credible, doesn't exist, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in, in Vern's mind, Vern never did that, that he never got into invention, never got into going beyond what we thought and knew at the time. And that's not true with respect to Vern. Vern was very creative in a lot of ways. But he does hit upon something significant with respect to Wells. And as the quote from Wells, almost as a response back to Verne, Wells said at one point in his life, I am extravagantly obsessed with the thing that might be and impatient with the present. And that's what Wells was all about. Wells looked around, saw what the world was like, studied its history and decided there's gotta be something better than this. And he invented, and he invented lots of stuff, both technologically, scientifically, and social politically. So a dividing line, another, another dividing line between Verne and Wells is Verne is fundamentally pre-evolution. Wells is post-evolution. If there's any idea, central idea, that structured Wells' thinking, it was the theory of evolution. Wells was a complete, utter evolutionist and a lot of his futurist writing, a lot of his science fiction follows from his thoughts on the evolutionary nature of reality. And he wants to go to the future. That's what he's obsessed with. How do we get to the future? <clears throat> and this is a quote from his autobiography. The story will begin in perplexity and go on to a troubled and unsystematic awakening. Um, and indeed, Wells' early life was a combination of psychological frustration, psychological confl conflicts, and almost dying due to diseases and, and different infirm physical infirmities that he um, uh, encountered as, as a youth. But it will culminate in the attainment of a clear sense of purpose. Wells had purpose, deep purpose conviction that the coming great world of order is real and sure. And that and this was written in the 1930s when Wells is pushing 70, that he believed for humanity as a whole, literally, including himself as an individual case, 
that although we've struggled, although we've been confused, and although we've had lots of problems, we are moving towards something better. And Wells was clearly up to try to show what that better reality was going to be like and how you went about getting there, a great world of order. And that was foremost in his head. Now, there are certain key themes that emerge in his mind early on. First of all, we got to get rid of religion because it's, it's, uh, it's both misleading, destructive, and we got to use science instead because science is empowering, that science gives us a means by which to create our own destiny, where in religion, uh, uh, our destiny is turned over to God. So from his early frustrations with his extremely religious mother, he becomes very pro-science and, uh, and repeatedly is critical of religion. He grew up in a lower middle class reality, a reality of obscurity and mediocrity, and he wanted to achieve. He wanted to get out of that reality, that social reality started in, and to be recognized, to achieve something. They want, his parents wanted him to work in um, a, a draperies, uh, in a drapery shop. And he wanted to become a, a, a writer and uh, being of books and ideas. He felt that the world was mindless, that things were confused, and he saw reason as the pathway out of it. Instead of focusing on the past, he wanted to focus on the future. He thought, given our present educational systems, we're heading for a catastrophe. And he saw a much higher level of education being critically important for uh, us avoiding catastrophe. He tried to synthesize, in this case, it's not an either or, art and logic in his writings, especially in his utopian narratives. Although in some ways he believed in cosmic determinism, he was a great advocate for human freedom. And even though in some ways he emphasized the collective whole, how we all have to get together and become a global society, again, he emphasized the individual. He felt like there were two kinds of evolution in the world, natural and artificial. And what we had to do was work on the more cultural evolution as opposed to simply base everything on natural um, evolution. And he struggled with being an optimist as opposed to a pessimist. That was an ongoing struggle for him, an optimist with respect to the future. Those themes emerged in him early on when he was still a youth and influenced him throughout his life and his writings. Now I can mention here three uh, uh, resources, three books uh, for looking at Wells' early intellectual development and his early writings. The futurist uh, uh, W. Warren Wager, H.G. Uh, Wells' Traversing Time, uh, Michael Sherburn's H.G. Wells' Another Kind of Life, and to look at Wells' early writings in science and science fiction, uh, the book Early Writings in Science and Science Fiction by H.G. Wells, and that one, in fact, is up on the web. You could read that whole thing, which is where I read it. I didn't buy the book, the physical book, but I read the content of it off from online. Um, and I think I have a link which I can share with you if you want to look at any of these early articles. Up there, you'll also see a picture of young H.G. Wells standing next to a human skeleton before he got the mustache even as a student in Thomas Huxley's biology class. And Wells ended up earning a scholarship to um, a, a, a college, a university in uh, England, where Thomas Huxley, the great evolutionary biologist who was Darwin's bulldog, was the teacher. And Huxley was the biggest single intellectual influence on Wells during the years 1884 to 1885. It was through Huxley that Wells learned evolution. It was also through Huxley that Wells learned how to think, at least this is what he said, how to think clearly, logically, as opposed to in a muddle-headed and confused fashion. He definitely admired Thomas Huxley and he definitely thought Huxley taught him that. 
And I have a quote here, another quote from uh, Wells, which highlights out his transformative evolutionary vision that he was developing. Uh, this he wrote early on in the uh, article, The Cyclic Delusion. The great stream of the universe from past us and onward, the main course is forward. From things that are past and done with forever to things that are altogether new. That is, Wells highlighted as fundamental the transformative temporal nature of reality and of things passing away and new things becoming. This is Heraclitus 2,000 years later um, of becoming and passing away. And during the period of 1885 to 1895, uh, Wells wrote hundreds, I'm saying hundreds of essays, published essays that became increasingly popular in fact, one year, I think 1893, he published 120 essays in one year, um, in which he started to think about evolution, time, the future of humanity. Uh, and I'm just gonna highlight a few things here uh, and a few of these um, uh, essays. The recovery of the unique, in which Wells argues that no two things in reality are exactly alike. And we fool ourselves into thinking that there are things that are alike because we have common abstract nouns, but everything is unique. The universe rigid in which he lays out a four dimensional theory of reality based on physics that would provide for him a ontology to explain how you could have a time machine. So that was in his head back in the early 1890s, actually before that. Zoological re retrogression, he argues that it's quite possible that humanity may devolve in the future. The man of the year million, in which he speculates that humans in the future will get increasingly bigger heads, smaller bodies, and uh, become a, a very physically feeble creatures who uh, uh, can't digest their food anymore and have colossal brains. And this would become an image that he would use to some degree in the War of the Worlds and thinking about the Martians. His first book was a textbook of biology. He was a biology teacher early on. Extinction of man, man could go extinct. The limits of human plasticity, you could mess with human nature, it isn't set. Intelligence on Mars, there may be life on Mars, there may be intelligence, but it may not be human-like at all. And human evolution and artificial process, he argues that there's two kinds of evolution, the biological natural evolution that has created us and an emergent cultural evolution, a moral evolution, which is attempting to gain control of the biological forces of evolution. Because the biological forces of evolution get us into trouble. And morals and civilization, he argues that morals are not absolutes, but creations of civilization at the time. And Wells, you know, during this time had majored in science, studied with Huxley, but he got interested in literature and he got interested in writing essays about uh, uh, evolution and about the future of humanity and about the possibilities of um, uh, uh, the future, both positive and negative. Now, one thing that Wells notices, notes in these early essays, which is something to keep in mind for his later years, is that there's no guarantee that we are gonna be in the future the dominant intelligent species on the earth. It may be something else better than us that will come along. He brings that up in A Vision of the Past in 1887. But this is exactly what gets him depressed at the end of his life. That he gets rather depressed over the fact that humans don't look like they're gonna be the ones to move forward in, into the future, that it could possibly be somebody else because we sure as hell have, in his mind, failed at it. But early on, he clearly acknowledged that possibility. <clears throat> now, two good collections of the fiction that was to emerge in Wells after the, uh, 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 the mid-1890s 
uh, seven of his best science fiction novels. This book has been reproduced a million times with a million different colors, uh, co not colors, covers, and best science fiction stories of H.G. Wells. And we're familiar with his novels, but H.G. Wells wrote a lot of short stories, science fiction short stories. He says about his uh, science fiction, early science fiction, that these stories of mine collected here do not pretend to deal with possible things. They're all fantasies. And indeed, that's half true and half not true because most of his stories, most of his novels, indeed do contain in them various scientifically informed and thoughtful considerations about the possibilities of the future and the possibilities of existence and science. They're, they're, so they're, uh, they've been called scientific romances, but they definitely are a lot more than just simply fantasies. But I would recommend these two basic resources to look at his science fiction, both his novels, his early ones, his early novels, and his short stories. Um, now, uh, uh, given he wrote so much, I can't really go into great detail uh, about his uh, short stories, let alone his novels, but here's a list of some of his most significant short stories written in that period of 1894 to 1901. Uh, the Stolen Basilisk, which is actually a story about someone attempting to wage chemical warfare, thinking they have stolen a very poisonous microbe that they're going to throw in the waters of um, a, a, um, a, a, a reservoir, and then they find out that all the uh, a microbe does is turn everybody blue. It's funny. Um, the Plantner story is about a man who disappears and then reappears reversed with his right side on his left and his left side on his right. And he says he went off into another dimension. The Star, which is an extremely well done story about something coming out of the blue and terrifying humanity, which is an approaching astral body that destroys a lot of human civilization. I would recommend The Star as one of his best short stories. The Man Who Could Work Miracles, which they made into a movie 30 years later, about somebody one day who was given the power to wish anything into existence. And it turns out not to be such a good thing that one has the mental power to, to fabricate anything one wants. And it's a story actually about what happens when you give somebody foolish and somebody thoughtless in, in, in infinite power. And the new accelerator is a story about someone who creates this uh, a chemical that speeds up metabolism so that time moves much slower for them relative to you. So they kind of zip around and people around them can't see them. Those are three of his most famous short stories. And they're pretty good in different ways, but they don't match in any sense the imagination that will occur and be manifested in his early uh, great science fiction. And the starting point for his uh, a great science fiction novels is going to be The Time Machine, um, which is, um, uh, which was published in uh, 1895, but Wells actually started writing this thing seven or eight years late earlier, and it went through multiple versions. It began as the chronic Argonauts, from Jason and the Argonauts. And Argonauts, Argo was the ship that Jason's uh, crew sailed on. Argonauts were the sailors and chronic means time. So literally this first story that turned into the novel was the time travelers. That's how it started. And then it became the time travelers story in 1894. And then eventually the time traveler, uh, the time machine. So Wells worked on this through multiple iterations for a long period of time and finally published it in 1895. And this is where he first achieved worldwide fame. And this became one of the most, most famous novels ever. It became a novel that, that engendered or stimulated in the reader a sense of cosmic consciousness because you go 30 million years out into the future in this novel. And it's also a prediction based on present trends of where humanity is heading. Because when the time traveler goes out to 800,000 AD, he finds the Eloi, pictured here as 
small childlike beings, the time travel holding Weena, and the Morlocks, who are these hideous, dark, human-like creatures who live below the surface of the earth and eat the Eloys, but take care of the Eloys. And this is a, a pretty transparent prediction of what's gonna happen to the wealthy and the rich who have everything they need provided for them by the poor who live in dark factories and disgusting uh, inner city slums and serve the rich. Because the Morlocks indeed are the descendants of the poor industrial class and the Eloi are the descendants of the rich upper class. And in the end, the poor get the revenge against the rich because in the end, the poor will end up eating the rich. <laughs> and that's in fact where the idea of the Eloi and the Morlock come from. Um, and the time traveler observes all of this having, having created the time machine and going out. And uh, just as a note here on scientific plausibility, the time machine contains a scientific theory of the temporal dimension of reality as the fourth dimension, along with the other three, that does provide a plausible grounding for how one could have a time machine, how one could move through time, if time indeed is the fourth dimension. But there's absolutely no explanation in this novel of how the time machine works. So even if I can establish what Wells tried to do, how you could travel through time, he doesn't explain at all what kind of mechanism could possibly do that. But he travels out, the time traveler travels out the 30 million years in the future and sees the literal death of the earth and sees very little alive around them. And it becomes a very bleak vision at the end. Uh, humanity seems to devolve from the Eloi and the Morlocks into even more primitive creatures that look like fuzzy little rabbits with human faces. And the insects seem to gain control of the earth. And so do the crabs. And in the end, there's one octopus-like structure floating in a dark sea at 30 million years in the future. But it's a very powerful and dramatic and uh, what, uh, 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 what uh, imaginative vision of the far, far distant future. And this is going to be the first in a series of his great science fiction novels. And The Time Machine has been imitated and redone over and over and over again, hundreds of times since then. Now, that's probably a good place to stop and take a break, uh, since I've been going on here close to about 45 minutes. Okay, we're at the time machine. Okay, Tom, I'm starting to record. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> one, one just last quick point or, or to make about Wells with, um, the, um, with the time machine is um, when, where am I, I'm trying to find, I know I wrote it down someplace here. I just wanted to give you a little quote, which I swear I wrote down someplace here. Um, but now I don't see it, so the hell with it. Um, <clears throat> to go on, <clears throat> I was gonna give you a little quote there about how well saw himself as uh, a, a, a person who was out of his own time and trying to move us into a better time that comes out of uh, the chronic Argonauts. Uh, but I can't seem to find it. I thought I had written it down. It's in my book. Um, but let's jump ahead, all right? And let's jump ahead to uh, the uh, Island of Dr. Moreau, which was his next big science fiction bestseller. This one was extremely popular too, just like The Time Machine. And here is a quote from a review of The Island of Dr. Moreau. This book should be kept out of the way of young people and avoided by all who have good taste, good feelings, or feeble nerves. And The Island of Dr. Moreau is Wells' most gruesome and horrific novel. They have never matched in the movies they have done of it how 
terrifying and dark and uh, frightening, the images that Wells creates of this island where Dr. Moreau is attempting to turn animals into humans as well as combine animals together, uh, which he also was doing in, um, in the novel. And it is a frightening tale, both of the mad scientist who wants to be God, as well as the whole idea of God as wanting its creations to worship it. And uh, uh, th in the end, Moreau is killed. Uh, the island uh, turns into a, a conflagration of fire and mayhem, but it's a warning book about uh, the use of science uh, by a power-hungry, God-obsessed individual who wants to control his creations. And as I said, it is immensely gruesome as a novel. Great horror novel. Great, great horror novel. Um, then, a year later, he published a third one that drew a lot of attention, The Invisible Man. Now, what some people might know about, not know about The Invisible Man is that it is an exceedingly funny novel. And this is the first time we see a dimension of Wells come through in his writing, in a novel length writing, is that Wells had a real talent for creating comical realities out of disasters and out of uh, horrendous and hideous uh, situations. He could turn it into black humor, and the Invisible Man is black humor. It's another case of a mad scientist becoming more mad the longer he stays invisible, who wants to have incredible power. And, in, and another thing, uh, because he's invisible, and another thing we see in this novel, the third one that brings out another dimension of Wells, is this novel is inspired by Plato. Because in Plato's dialogues, there is a um, section where Socrates is discussing with some other learned individuals, what would happen if one had a ring that you could put on your finger that would make you invisible so that no one could see anything that you could do and therefore you would have infinite power or unlimited power to do whatever you want. And Socrates' argument is that if someone was given such incredible power to move around unseen, it would turn them into a slave to that power. It would corrupt their character and it would end no good. Even though a lot of people would think, wouldn't it be great to be invisible and do whatever you wanted? And that story inspired Wells to write The Invisible Man, where the invisibility factor is created through a chemical. And, but it brings up something else about Wells' erudition, which is that Wells studied red, thought seriously about, and was significantly influenced by Plato. And we'll see that in his utopias. Next, we come to one of his most famous novels, The War of the Worlds. And this is what provoked Garrett Service into writing Edison's Conquest of Mars. And the War of the Worlds is another metaphor. In this case here, it's a metaphor on Western imperialist countries with superior technology and weaponry deciding to invade an indigenous population who doesn't have the same level of technological development or weaponry for purposes of colonizing that planet and, or, or that land and getting rid of the inhabitants, pushing them out of the way so they can use that land for their own purposes and ends. And that is both 19th century West and 19th century Martians as envisioned by H.G. Wells. And so the Martians, out of the blue again, here we have another out of the blue scenario. Everybody's going around, you know, focused on their individual lives. No one's paying attention to the big issues. Everybody's complacent. Nobody's thinking about what could possibly happen, what disasters can incur, that we live in this gigantic universe. What's up there? 
And then boom, the Martians land and just beat the shit out of us. And the only reason in the end why the Martians are defeated is because they fall victim to the bacteria on the earth. And Wells, in fact, in here alludes to the fact that perhaps God in the beginning placed the bacteria on the earth to be a defense against alien invaders. And it's sort of half, and that's sort of half serious and half not, simply because I know Wells from this time for sure was very anti-theistic and anti-religious. So although he includes that in there, I don't know how much he believed that, but he does say at the end, watch the skies, which became a, um, um, a, a, a common theme in the 20th century, watch the skies, the invaders may come and get you. And so here we have another one of those, you better be prepared, you better watch out, you better have a bigger picture of things because God knows you could get invaded. And in this case here was the Martians that did it. Now, Wells does a very good job here of describing disaster, of describing war. And that's something he would do over and over again in the next 20 years. He was very good at giving you firsthand, highly uh, detailed, sensory powerful visions of war and disaster. Very good at doing that. Then he published a couple years later, The First Men in the Moon. And The First Men in the Moon is another example of using aliens to think about a, the possibilities of intelligent civilization and the ways it could go, and then to critique it. This is his most imaginative book on alien life and alien civilization. It's a description of uh, a, a world in ecology where every time the um, uh, sun disappears from the sky, um, uh, all the life on, on the moon <clears throat> freezes up and disappears. And then when the sun comes back up again, it all reconstitutes itself and grows all over again. A very intricate description of moon ecology. And then an intricate description of the Selenites, who are the advanced beings on the moon, who have an extremely stratified society where there are a whole slew of different forms of Selenites who are insect-like, and they are genetically different, and they serve different functions in that society. Hence, you're born into a particular class and a particular function. There's no flexibility. And the whole thing is ruled hierarchically by the Grand Lunar. And so we have an absolute power pyramid and everybody in its place. It almost sounds like, it almost sounds in a way like uh, Plato's Republic. Uh, and it's a critique of that model. Although Wells would come very close at times to thinking of an ideal future human reality that was hierarchical with somebody on top, although he had a group on top as opposed to an individual, and that different people had different, uh, in this case, you know, the Selenites had different functions, et cetera, and that's where you stay. Um, so it's a good discussion of, um, uh, of utopia, dystopia, of uh, what are the possibilities of intelligent civilizations and what could go right, what could go wrong with them. And like I said, it's the most detailed description he ever came up with of an alien world with alien life forms and alien civilization. Very, very good book on that. Now, just as a little stopping point here, I just put this slide up so you could see uh, from War of the Worlds, uh, some of the early uh, um, pictures that were drawn of uh, uh, the novel. There's uh, at least two, perhaps three different sets here that were produced uh, over uh, the early editions. And we could see some of the early depictions of the Martian tripods and of the Martians who looked sort of like octopus and of uh, uh, disaster and war. Uh, and shows you how science fiction art was evolving at that time too. But some of it looks rather silly, like the Martian tripods have eyes and uh, they look like, uh, you know, walking uh, toys in ways in some of them. 
Uh, but this is how science fiction art was moving along toward the end of the 19th century. In this case, you know, the illustrations for the War of the Worlds. <clears throat> now, at this point, Warren Wager says that Wells decided to start a second career. After becoming famous and making lots of money with his first wave of science fiction novels, he decides that he is going to start a second career and become a futurist. And in 1901 and 1902, he published two books, Anticipations and the Discovery of the Future, in which he presented the argument that there's two different kinds of people in the world, those who look to the past and those who look to the future. And it's possible to have a scientific discipline of studying the future, just like we have a scientific discipline of studying the past, history. And that based on observing various historical trends, and keep in mind, Wells was a historian, deep historian who looked at the history of human civilization, we can extrapolate out into the future. So in anticipations, Wells creates a whole slew of different predictions of the future of humanity, social, technological, environmental, economic, political, across the board. And <clears throat> what he does with that is he argues that these trends are leading to a global society of humanity, which he thinks is a good thing because we presently are afflicted with too much militarism and nationalistic competition, and that we are going to come together into a new kind of society, which is global in organization. <clears throat> so as a futurist, he lays out probabilistic predictions based on trend extrapolation and history, and then he turns to a preferable future image which he calls the New Republic, as an, ar as an argument for <clears throat> not only where we are going, but why it's a good thing to head in that direction. One of his most famous quotes comes out of the discovery of the future, <clears throat> which is, it is possible to believe that all the past is but the beginning of a beginning, and that all that is and has been is but the twilight of the dawn. It is possible to believe that all that the human mind has ever accomplished is but the dream before the awakening. And that, that's a quote that I have pondered, thought about, got inspired over many, many times. And that was, that was written in the Discovery of the Future in 1901. Also, life forever dying to be born afresh, forever young and eager, will presently stand upon this earth as upon a footstool and stretch out its realm amidst the stars. There's Wells being the optimist. There's Wells looking at the future as a time of incredible awe and wonder and, mag and, and a, a magnificent reality to think about. But he's also thinking here, can you really seriously, scientifically and thoughtfully make extrapolations of where we are now to where we will be in the future? And so in that sense, he definitely is a architect in the creation of future studies. And this is not science fiction. This is him laying out in non-fictional form what he thinks are the strong possibilities to come. Now you can take those ideas and you can turn them into science fiction novels. And in fact, The Sleeper Awakes is a science fiction version of anticipations, but it's a bleak vision and a bleak extrapolation off of it, which was a, a science fiction novel to come. So Wells turns his attention to future studies for a number of years there. Oh, and also Mankind in the Making, which he presents the argument that the uh, essence of mankind is still not finished, we're in the making. And from there, he starts writing a series of utopian and dystopian science fiction novels, either visions of ideal futures or of depressing pessimistic futures for humanity in the form of novels, narratives. And somebody said about Wells, heaven defend us from his utopias, but we like his explosions. And Wells often included in his utopias or dystopias, lots of explosions, lots of war and mayhem going on. 
This is an image, uh, a, a, a kind of sensory overload image from the sleeper awakes. And uh, we'll come to that in a moment, but the sleeper awakes is a, the beginning of it is a psychologically, mentally overpowering vision of future humanity where it's so strange and so bizarre, it takes you 20, 30 pages to get oriented to what the hell is going on here. This is where Wells really excelled in creating a phantasmagoric future, the sleeper awakes, which derived off of anticipations. But to begin with, in 1904, at the beginnings of his dystopias and utopias, in 1905, he created two utopias. Now, one that is not read as much, but I think is one of his best, is The Food of the Gods. And this one is really, really funny. And it's a metaphor. It's about two scientists who discover a drug that can increase the growth and the size of living creatures and stupidly give it to these two farmers, a husband and wife, to experiment on chickens on a farm out away from the city and these two people start feeding it both to their son and losing a lot of it and getting into the waterways around them, creating giant wasps and giant rats. But the, the long and the short of it is that in, uh, after 20, 30 years, there are humans walking around who are 50 to 60 feet high. And they look on us as pygmies, as mental pygmies, as well as physical pygmies. And it's a metaphor on what would happen if a new form of humanity came about that was vastly superior to us, how would we react to it? And the way Wells depicts how we would react to it is that the present humans would be uh, threatened by the superior humans because they make us feel inferior and, dis and that we're gonna disrupt the status quo. So here we have homo superior being attacked by homo inferior. And in the end, the more advanced humans, the higher, the bigger humans uh, conquer. But it's a very, very funny novel. A modern utopia, which was inspired both by Plato's Republic and by the samurai concept of a ruling elite, a merit meritocracy elite, is a vision of an alternative earth in which Wells lays out what a utopia would be like and does it in great detail, both technologically and psychologically. It's, but it's modeled on Plato's Republic, which is fundamentally a hierarchy of power. And Wells does a very good job in this book of doing a historical review of all previous images of utopias. Now, one key feature of a modern utopia, it's a feature that we still have not figured out how to conceptualize, is Wells realized that you can't have a utopian vision which presents a static, perfect society, that reality and humanity is transformative and evolving, and so any preferable human society has to have built into it the capacity to keep going beyond itself, to be self-transforming. There is no perfect human society. If the closest you get to perfection is a mechanism that keeps revising the plans because you can't have a static human society uh, that's perfect because reality is transformative and there's always more to learn and there's always ways to make it better. So a modern utopia presents one of the first clear visions of a dynamic, evolutionary, better society that is not static like Plato's Republic or Thomas More's uh, utopia. After two positive visions, he gives us two really negative ones. The novel that has the most carnage, most war, most destruction, of any of Wells' novels is The War in the Air. It is a depiction of humanity destroying itself through air war. The United, uh, the, the New York is bombed and disseminated 
by Germans. The Asians invade the West Coast. The Asians defeat the Germans in Niagara Falls. Everything blows up and civilization crumbles. And the interesting thing about this novel, and it's another one of those future war novels, a warning, uh, national militism and uh, advances in weaponry, in particular air power, is gonna be our undoing. The interesting thing about this is that this is also Wells' funniest novels, uh, is his funniest novel. Um, it is humans bungling and, and screwing up all along the way, and in the end, destroying, literally almost destroying themselves completely. And I highly recommend The War in the Air as a warning. Now, H.G. Wells wrote The Sleeper Awakes in 1899, and he redid it and wrote it again. And, uh, it, and it was published in, what, 1910, the second time. Um, and The Sleeper Wakes is about a man who wakes up, 1910, it was published the second time, in uh, London in uh, 2100 AD, uh, after being asleep for over 100 years, and he finds himself in a techno-utopia. And in fact, um, it was probably inspired in part by Bellamy's Looking Backward, where somebody wakes up 100, 30 years into the future. Um, and although the world at first appears highly advanced with all kinds of marvelous technologies, it becomes increasingly clear that this world is a, uh, a, a dystopia where the ruling elite who get the benefits of all of the power that's been achieved through science and technology keep the workers actually subterranean in a state of deprivation and a whole revolution occurs through because of it. Uh, in some ways notice that this is a kind of stop along the way where we eventually get to the time machine. It's also an anticipation of what is to come later, metropolis, with the richer above, the poorer below, and the rich take advantage of the poor, and the poor don't get an equal amount of all of the wealth and wonders of technology. It's a clear warning of the situation we're still in today, 100 years later. Um, and it, it's, an, it, it's an amazing feat in uh, uh, technological extrapolation, uh, but it's also a clear warning. And uh, here's an image from uh, uh, early publication of it, of the sleeper looking down onto London. And London is a very strange and unusual multi-level reality with cables going all over the place and telecommunications. Uh, and it, it's, good, it's good for a, a future extrapolation for sure. Um, then over the next decade, he wrote The World Set Free and Men Like Gods, two more science fiction novels, one dystopia transforming into a utopia, the other straight out utopia. The World Set Free is where he predicts the atomic bomb. And he feels that humanity is going to understand how to control nuclear energy, but at the same time, humanity is not gonna have the wisdom to control it wisely, and it's gonna end up using it in war and weaponry. In fact, from The World Set Free, we have the quote, certainly it seems now that nothing could have been more obvious to people of the early 20th century than the rapidity with which war was becoming impossible. And certainly they did not see it. They did not see it until the atomic bombs burst in their fumbling hands. And so an atomic war breaks out, a global atomic war, and the uh, 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 few uh, leaders of uh, different nations decide that we just have to throw out the old and start different and have a global society because we can't keep fighting against each other because our weapons are too fireable and atomic uh, uh, weapons are outlawed. And it's kind of a disjointed novel, but it clearly is, again, an argument for, from Wells' point of view that militant nationalism empowered by super weapons is gonna lead to disaster. And men like gods, which was written in 1923. This is Wells, I think, best effort at combining his futurist thinking and utopian thinking 
in a science fiction narrative where a group of people from our earth in our time accidentally are transported to an alternate world, earth in an alternate dimension that's 3,000 years ahead of us. And what they do is they observe a world and people who are way beyond us in terms of their ethical character, their sanity, their health, their longevity. And what do the humans from our earth in our time think? They think, this is terrible, this is awful, this is blasphemous, this can't go on. And they try to actually conquer this more advanced alternate earth, which is ridiculous. But again, Wells presents the argument here, you show, some, you show people something that's better, you show exactly why it is better, and people will go, oh no, I don't wanna do that, that's terrible, that's awful, and they try to destroy it. But in the end, they lose. But it's the best example where he combines a good storyline with a lot of good utopian argument. Now let's see, what do we got here now? 11.42. Okay, I'm coming sort of toward the end. The last, the last uh, um, a significant novel to come to with Wells is The Shape of Things to Come, which came out in 1933. They made it into a movie, Things to Come in 1936. And this is Wells' most well-researched, thoughtful, intellectual, historically grounded, and elaborate utopian vision. Um, it is a challenge to the intellect to read this because he definitely gets into a lot of history, a lot of political thinking, economic, social thinking in the beginning, which is kind of historical, future directional thinking. Where is this all going? Where did it come from? But then he, he develops a narrative on top of it of what's going to happen over the next 150, 160 years. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, book is uh, uh, divided into six sections, an introduction where presumably uh, it's explained that this whole book was uh, given to him, given to H.G. Wells, by his friend, Dr. Philip Raven, who said he transcribed this whole book from dreams, and somehow he was able to see into the future. And so what is laid out here is the dream book of Dr. Philip Raven. And the first uh, 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 section of it, Today and Tomorrow, talks about how we got to the uh, age of frustration we're in. That's the historically deep and penetrating part. The second part describes contemporary times, which includes a prediction of World War II, which of course did happen, but a plague to follow. And obviously we're in a plague right now. This causes the collapse of world civilization. And out of that, we get the birth of the modern state, which is a global society. <clears throat> it sounds very similar to the model he presents in a modern utopia. And it's a ruling meritocracy. <clears throat> it becomes very organized and control oriented, a benevolent dictatorship, which eventually eliminates all last vestiges of the past. You got to get rid of the past. In Wells' mind, you can't have a viable utopia unless it's global. And then the final part talks about the increasing power of human psychology as the fundamental controller of human civilization. That is, we need to understand our minds, understand how they work, understand what goes right and wrong with them, and educate and evolve our minds. And that is the key. And in fact, uh, eventually what we want to do is we want to evolve humanity, evolve the human mind. And this is Wells' most clear example of where he argues that the key to a better world is not through better gadgets, but through better minds. And that comes through in the shape of things to come. And it's a very interesting book, but like I said, you know, this is not an easy thing to read. It is like 500 pages long or whatever it is, 400 pages long. And it's really intellectually dense, but it's worth it. Definitely worth reading through the whole thing as he thinks it out, thinks out the past, thinks out the present and thinks out the future. And indeed, in the last 20 years of his life, he wrote a whole slew of non-fictional books, including his autobiography, 
The Outline of History, uh, which was his biggest selling book, The Open Conspiracy, where he indeed lays out how to go about producing a world revolution to change the world. Um, the World Brain, which some people say is an anticipation of the internet and, uh, wik uh, and uh, 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 Wikipedia. Um, and uh, another quote I hear from uh, Wells here, you know, we fight not for ourselves, uh, rather uh, we fight for growth, uh, growth that goes on forever. Tomorrow, whether we live or die, growth will conquer through us, which is fundamentally an argument for the, um, uh, 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 the process of evolution and that that's what we're fighting for. And even if we die in the process, evolution will go on. So he's being optimistic and being optimistic in, in the sense of a, a better global humanity <clears throat> built on education. And a, a thing to just point out right now is another key thing about Wells is he tried to write a series of comprehensive books which outline first all of human history, biology, sociology, education, economics. That is, he was trying to create a world encyclopedia while he was alive. And other people helped him along the way with it eventually. <laughs> so, um, his last book though, which is actually he wrote two last books that are published together. You can buy this. They're both pretty short. Uh, the Happy Turning and uh, Mind at the End of Its Tether. And in Mind at the End of Its Tether, which was written a year before he died, there is this famous quote. The human story has already come to an end. This is right around the time of the end of World War II in his present form played out. The stars in their courses have turned against him and he has to give place to some other animal, animal better adapted to face the fate that closes in more and more swiftly upon mankind. The writer is convinced that there is no way out or round or through the impasse. It is the end. Now that's in a mind at the end of its tether. And a thing, uh, a starting point to sort of interpret that quote is that Wells all through his life, through his fiction and nonfiction, through his study of history and science and philosophy, attempted to understand the problems with contemporary humanity at a global level. He attempted to predict out into the future and to lay out both warnings for bad ways to go and utopian visions of right ways to go. He attempted to take those visions of positive directions for humanity and publicize them in every way possible to the world. As I said, he had conversations with both Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt with Lenin and Stalin and Churchill and a Pavlov, the Russian psychologist, and Winston Churchill, who he was pretty good friends with, I guess, attempting to get them to see that there could be a better world and this is how it could be a better world. He attempted to influence the general educated public, the people around him. And he kind of got increasingly frustrated with us. And if anything, this quote at the end here could be seen as a quote, embodying his frustration of a whole lifetime spent with trying to understand us, where we have come from, where we should be heading, and we've just come out of another world war. And at the beginning of his career, he clearly acknowledged the possibility that humanity could be transcended. We could devolve, we could go extinct. He knew that. Evolution doesn't present any guarantees, but he hoped and he kept hoping that there might be some way for us to get to a better place. But by, 19, uh, by 1945, at least at some of the time, he did get a bit depressed over the whole thing and wanted to just say, you know, 
This ain't gonna work. We're not gonna work. We just don't have it in us. Right? That's our question for today. You know, Wells was an optimist. He saw what the problems were, but he saw how to try to fix them. And no matter how hard he tried to try to fix them, humanity seemed to want to just keep shooting itself and fighting against each other and resisting education, resisting education. He saw education as key, resisting science, resisting reason, resisting the whole idea of evolution, clinging to the past. And he got frustrated with it all. So the question is, what do we do? You know, do we get frustrated with it all too? So uh, this is just a review of what I talked about today. There's another famous image of the War of the Worlds from Amazing Stories. Uh, his early education, thinking about evolution, his early science fiction, his early future studies, his dystopian utopian novels, his future wars, one after another. Oh, by the way, The Shape of Things to Come is another example of Wells' idea that the only way to get at that better place in the future is to have a big war in Armageddon, whatever it happens to be, which is going to clean the slate, is going to get rid of the old, it's going to come down to a war, and then you can move on. That's back all the way back to the uh, story of Armageddon. And then his thinking on evolution, his thinking on global utopianism, and then his frustration at the end of his life. Now, just as a prelude, next time we're gonna go into the 20th century with a lot of other writers, or the dystopias, other disasters, fantastic adventures, films, and films now are gonna come into science fiction, and the pulps. And up here we have images of two very famous films from the early 20th century, Melies' Trip to the Moon. And those, that image, every character in there and every apparatus in there, him and his wife colored them in on the film. And he's the first great science fiction filmmaker and the inventor of modern special effects. Within 25 years, we get the incredible Dionysian masterpiece, Metropolis, written by Thea von Harbo and produced and directed by her husband, uh, uh, Fritz Lang. And uh, Metropolis is a movie you could see. Of course, a lot of you probably have seen it. And you can, in fact, even watch uh, Amelie's movies online. They're there, too. But the next 20 years, the first 20 years of the 20th century is what we're going to talk about in the Pulps, where the magazines come in. So that's the end for today. Thank you for staying with me so that, indeed, we caught up with where I wanted to be. Uh, with, uh, let's see, we got to escape and then I could stop sharing. And thank you for all of your other comments. Now, before I start looking at them, 